good Abend to all of you. Thank you. And I can add uh, in a few of our languages, Sanborna, Molweni, Dumelang, Huyanand. I'm a creative writer, so you cannot blame me thinking that uh, uh, all the wonderful speeches that have been, we've heard so far were a way of creating the suspense for this big one. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to thank uh, Javier and the, the Embassy of the Republic of South Africa for inviting me and my colleagues to be with you this evening, reflecting on the 20th uh, anniversary of uh, South, the new democracy in South Africa. I also know that uh, there are a lot of uh, South Africans here who live in Germany and have been here for many years. We are delighted to bring South African greetings to you all and you hope you feel that our presence here keeps, uh, gives you more strength. <clears throat> And thank you, too, to all the Africans who live in, uh, in, in, in Germany. And then to our friends, the Germans who are here in the audience, who are, whose pres by whose presence they indicate their support for South Africa and for this event. We, we know that uh, we can still feel in the air the euphoria of happy citizens who have won the Soccer World Cup uh, very much. <laughs> My speech is uh, called Goodbye Santin and Hello Soweto. You must be asking yourself when you heard about the title what it is I could be having up my sleeve with such a title. Well, it is no secret. I wanted you to be asking the questions. And if you consider the distance from Santin to Soweto, it is nothing compared to the distance between Johannesburg and Berlin. But your impression of this distance between Johannesburg and Berlin might change when you consider that the journey between Santin and Soweto began in Berlin on the 15th of September, 1884. On that day, we are told, 14 states of some of the great powers of the time, including the United States, met in the grand ballroom of the palace of Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. A 16 feet map, high map of Africa dominated the room in which they met. Part of the spirit of that conference is captured in two clauses of the preamble to its outcomes. The first one I'd like to refer to goes the following. Wishing in the spirit of good and mutual accord to regulate the conditions most favorable to the development of trade and civilization in certain regions of Africa and to assure all nations the advances of free navigation on the two chief rivers of Africa flowing into the Atlantic Ocean. The second one goes, being desirous on the one hand to obviate the misunderstanding and disputes which might in future arise from new acts of occupation, prise the position on the coast of Africa and concerned at the same time as to the means of feathering the moral and material well-being of the native populations. 
the journey from Sentin to Soweto had begun. This was the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885. A little before this conference, the wars of conquest in Southern Africa had just about ended decisively with the defeat of the Zulus in April of 1879. At the time of the conference, diamond mining was underway in Kimberley and gold mining in Johannesburg was about to begin in earnest. Cecil John Rhodes was on his way to leaving this, his stamp first on the nature of capitalism in Southern Africa and second on the shape of the landscape on which it would develop and flourish. The administration of conquest in South Africa would develop and flourish. The administration of conquest then was well underway. The Berlin Conference gave such administration a permissive global character. So while you ponder in the back of your minds on these weighty facts of history I have just presented before you, I would like you to shift your gaze to a slice of life far less dramatic but potentially no less important. It comes from in the form of a, a nine bedroom residence in the village of Violet Bank in the province of Mpumalanga in South Africa. This building reportedly cost its owner 19 million rands. The house looks so huge and unwieldy in its surroundings that the Johannesburg Sunday Times, which published its picture last 13th of July, observed it could easily be mistaken for a hotel. But it might just carry some significant meaning for the future of South Africa. It may not be as grand as Chancellor Bismarck's palace, but it attracts attention in its nine ensued bedrooms, each with its own fireplace and chimney. The main bedroom has an office. There are three lounges, two bars, a theater, and an entertainment area suitable for all seasons. There is also a refrigeration room. Now, here is the human imagination at its freest conjuring into reality the dream house of a 40-year-old Mr. Tsepo Mahabane, who plans to use it for holidays and ultimately for his retirement. Meanwhile, he lives in another mansion in Pretoria with his family and four young children. A board in front of the house bears the words Ditamaha Baropodi. They ring like a self-displaying proclamation a kind of, through a clan name. But next to this verbal self-identifier is its visual image. It is the image, according to the Sunday Times, of a drawing of a tiger, which, according to Bedi culture, I quote, is a symbol of strength. It, convey, it conveys a message of his success. It seems Mr. Mahabane has a lot of money, and a lot of it remains after he has built his mansions. Interestingly, the article attracted two letters to the editor, and I will share them from, with you. One came from a Mr. Mawale, who, while writing from Johannesburg, originates from the village of Shadale, also in the province of Mpumalang. This reader is proud of Mr. Mahabane's achievement. He thinks that people like him, who overcame hardships to acquire an education, should not have to build a matchbox 
when he can afford a mention of his dreams. We from Bushbuck's Ridge, he says, are proud of people like Mahabane. They inspire us. The second letter is even more interesting. It comes from Mrs. Tobega Shangase of Deben. For three years, she writes intriguingly. I lived in a three-bedroom house in the suburbs. I felt at the time the suburbs were the next step for me. When it came to making our dream house a reality, my husband and I explored many options. We soon realized that a dream house in the suburbs came with a huge price tag. We decided to buy land in the township where we grew up and build our dream house there. We were able to build a seven bedroom house there for a fraction of the price. And living there is far more economical than living in the suburbs would be. For the past five years, there has been a huge influx of black people living affluent suburbs, such as Westville, Balito, and Umshanga, and building big houses in the townships. This is not a case of flaunting one's wealth. For many, building in the townships is a smart financial decision. Some of my neighbors have ocean view properties that they got cheap because they were in the township. It's a good thing that there is a return of people to the townships. People who are there to build and not destroy. The township is also a place where dreams are shaped and can be realized. People can be successful and they don't have to run to the suburbs. By living in the townships, we are able to send our children to a private school. We wouldn't be able to do that if we were living in the suburbs. If we want to slaughter a goat or a cow, we don't have to first get written permission from anyone or face fines. In the township, we are able to live and live well. Now, in Mr. Mahabanez is a story of uh, hidden in there, a story of generations of people who traveled far and wide to work in the mines and factories of a consolidated country that came to be called South Africa. At first, they moved out of compulsion, so they were forced. Taxes levied by their new rulers demanded from a mandate that they got from the Berlin Conference, transformed them into captured labor. Dispossessed of their conquered territories, they were compelled to work. Others came far beyond the borders of South Africa in a massive movement of people. They built factories, mines, farms, towns, and cities of South Africa. In time, compulsion miraculously transformed into opportunity. Decisions to go in search of work and opportunity began to have personal origins in addition to external pressures. There was a life to lead despite the new conditions. If the dreaming of the dispossessed was forcefully restricted for much of the 20th century, it intensified in the new democracy after 1994. Mr. Mahabane's mention is a factor partly of galloping dreams. Opportunity and money suddenly abounded. Mrs. Shanghai's choice, on the other hand, is more considered and calculated. It is creative, resourceful, and practical. She is a symbol of a strategic and practical imagination. 
Much of the country that was imagined in the cause of a liberation struggle of close to a century has been embodied in the South African Constitution. The question we must now ask is how much of that imagined country has been created, taking into account the imaginative and practical resourcefulness of Mrs. Shanghai's choices. It is more as if the new democracy was catching up rather than creating and adjusting creatively. The messages of creative social adjustment are abandoned in townships across the land. They call for a determined and focused political expression. It could be said in this context that the presidencies of Mandela and Mbegi complemented each other in a high level sort of way. The overarching, transcendent, and evocative, evocative presidency of Mandela that prioritized nation building through reconciliation would give way to the hands-on state management of Mbegi. Despite Mandela's broadly transcendent approach, there were also there was a sort of grand sweep of provision. The doors of learning from primary to higher education for millions of South Africans opened wider. So did health facilities, clean drinking water, and better sanitation and electricity became more universally available even in informal settlements. Wages went up and consumer goods of all types of description became a general feature of life. Particularly in the urban air centers of South Africa, in their varied sizes, hundreds of thousands of houses were built to meet a demand that had grown over many, many decades. South Africans could travel more easily throughout the length and breadth of their country for business, leisure, or private obligations of many description. The scale of public social communication rose to unprecedented levels in South Africa as people talked to one another through radio, television, and print media. Facebook and Twitter have added to the crisscrossing of billions of words among people. Freedom of speech in particular, enshrined in the Constitution among other rights, allowed for the flourishing of a robust press that is as vigilant in the new democracy as it was courageous in the dark days of apartheid. The high global regard for South Africa as a model country for peaceful transitions in the face of intractable complications in its history and a vision for its future enshrined in a much admired constitution made for high visibility and impact in the new democracy's international relations. One of the results of those relations is our presence here today. It was a grand moment, but a, spe a spectral question rose to the surface. What will it take to sustain all this? Not enough time, I believe, was spent on this question. The speed of, del of delivery was not tested for sustainability and durability. Houses, electrical, Wires, satellite dishes, and water taps have an immediate visual impact of sweeping presence. They are instant provision, almost certainly dependent in the most part on capabilities inherited from the apartheid state itself. The desire to achieve a similar sense of dramatic immediacy in the educational realm, for example, saw so some catastrophic mistakes made in the public schooling system. More about this later. But the point is, state capability across the spectrum of national life 
depends on the education system, which takes many, many years to build, although it can be destroyed very quickly. And it would be hard to reproduce within an immediacy framework. What prompted such discontinuity within the schooling system cannot be dismissed easily. The record of history is very clear that white people in South Africa, through their historic and purposeful dominance of the commanding heights of government, the economy, and the range of cultural institutions located themselves in domains of the highest value in the national life of the country. Those domains accorded them the autonomy to thrive within them at the same time as they created an entrenched dependence on the part of black people purposefully excluded from them. White laws reduced black people into instruments in a system that needed them to maintain it even in their re required subservience to it. Black people may have resented the situation, as they did, but they nevertheless grew to be dependent on it. Thus, both the white master and the black servant were equally attracted to, the highest, where, to where the highest political, economic, legal, and social value at the national scale was to be located. They lived there and worked together, more in a state of managed conflict than willing collaboration. It goes without saying that should an opportunity arise, the dispossessed, instrumentalized, and excluded millions will want to seize control of the commanding heights of national life and replace the people who have dominated it to their exclusive benefit for over 100 years of, of South African capitalism. It is almost, it is the most natural thing to expect that people so oppressed will react in that particular kind of way. But this seizing control can come with both opportunities and threats are the newly enfranchised now in power able to find the critical balance between aspiration and the necessary conditions critical to deliver the desires of aspiration? Was the intellectual, political, economic, and cultural self-interest of the new citizens of the Republic as robust, as focused, as principled, as the colonial self-interest that dominated them and shaped them for over a century. The strategic gap, then, between aspiration and achievement in the first five to 10 years of the new democracy was necessarily narrowed to put a stamp of legitimacy to the state in the transition to democracy. The quickly you act and provide certain things, the more legitimacy you have. But sustaining achievement became much more unpredictable in the second term of President Begi, as the opportunities of intervention turned into threats widening the strategic gap. The levels of unpredictability are critically high in the ongoing tenure of President Zuma. The ability for the 10-year-old democracy to deliver on its promises has become perilously uncertain. One way to understand this is to reflect on how we have, since 1994, de dealt with uh, uh, an issue I've reflected upon many years, some four years ago, that I have called resilient factors that stand in the way of fundamental transformation in the South African state towards a qualitative democracy. Resilient factors 
are defined as follows. Are conditions that resist change even as they give the appearance of change. The, such conditions, the focus of good intentions always, soon undermine the very good intentions through the depth and durability of their embedded effects. Change that is genuinely sought is delayed because the permanent solution is sought, sought is impossible to achieve within a time frame of immediacy, regardless of the justice of the desire for it. In the accumulation of such delays, the sense of transition risks becoming frustratingly permanent because the process towards a desired lasting end is seldom spelt out as a feature of political management. The governments always think that when they promise something, it's going to happen, and then people think it's going to happen because people are not told that some of the things that are promised will actually take a very long time to reach fruition. And this causes problems within the population. The resulting state of inertia may generate its own politics, which may be as vibrant as any, but actually produces the effect of dancing on the same ground, exciting, but of little essence. South Africans will recall that in the first five years of democracy, the transformation objective of changing the demographic composition of teachers in the schooling system led to many policies, among them the offering of early retirement packages to teachers. In the main, many of the best left in large numbers. Many of the not so best remained. 15 years later, the public education system where millions of the poor are educated stands on its knees. Education as the base for cross-generational reproduction of social capability has yet to support a new democracy for the long run. Then there is the resilience of the inherited apartheid landscape. For a people so extensively traumatized and anguished by settlements created for their dehumanization, the new citizens of South Africa have displayed an exasperating lack of agency in their commitment to changing these conditions in the townships in radical ways. The townships already orientated towards an outward reality of service in servitude remain today dormitory enclaves which still export their energies every day in ways conceived, designed, and carried out for over a century of South African capitalism. Post-apartheid provision of housing has not produced bold models that rep represent alternative conceptualizations of settlements that answer to the dreams and desires of the dispossessed. The statistically successful provision of houses has not extended the horizons of social imagination. When we built millions of houses, we forgot that we needed to build not so much houses, but to build communities. I have pondered on the state of trade unionism in South Africa as well, as another resilient factor. Since 1973, the trade union movement gave tremendous impetus to the anti apartheid struggle in South South Africa. Its impact has been in the key sectors of the economy, mining, health, manufacturing, education, and transport. It has consolidated itself to take full advantage of the democratic spaces created in a post-apartheid state. But 
Its engagement with the embedded mechanisms of a capitalist state appears to have locked it into a logic of redress and redistribution. In, the, in that context, the struggle for higher wages, while understandable, has inadvertently subjugated a larger objective to the wage demand. The wage demand, however understandable, fights the system on its own terms. The wage has become disembodied in the broader lifestyle enhancement sought for the workers and their families in an overarchingly capable state. Marikana demonstrated this horribly. The dormitory townships in which millions of union members live persists. Workers are still alienated from the state in a manner reminiscent of pre-liberation days. The quest for a collective interest to channel diverse loyalties towards a redesigned state is far from over. The state seems unable to manage diverse collective interests towards a coherent and overriding goals of a collective interest. The fundamental goal is universal social enablement in which the net of opportunity and state support is cast as widely as possible over the ocean of South Africa's human talent. The goal is properly situated in an overarching project of nation building. Perhaps the greatest symbol of embedded resilience is the ultimate achievement of the Berlin Conference on Africa. It is a place that has within it what has been described that is in Africa. It has a place within it that has been described as, quote unquote, the richest square mile in Africa. This place houses the largest stock exchange on the continent with a market capitalization of 903 US billion dollars in 2012. This place is the last home of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange since it moved there in the year 2000 after abandoning the almost decayed central business district of Johannesburg. Of course, the central business district of Johannesburg, let us not forget, was itself the ultimate achievement of the old money of the 19th century gold mining and its rent lords. After over a century of accumulated assets and a business culture that reproduced its origins, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange sought a new home and found it, as you will guess, in Sandton. It was a long journey from the establishment of Africa's first stock exchange on the 8th of November in 1887, two years after the Berlin Conference. Sandton, attracting immediate attention with its massive modern buildings, it exerts a solid authority of modernity. Mr. Mahabane's mansion in Violet Bank in its structural architectural resonance clearly aspires towards some kind of sentin. But it is now clear that more was needed than evocative aspiration in the desired and necessary replacement of white power by enfranchised citizens. The historical contest between white and black, developed and sustained by whites as a justifying ideology, has increasingly been restored in the new democracy as a primary site on which to place the critique of state capability. This, I believe, is a serious mistake. Race relations may be important in the first 20 years of South Africa's transition to democracy, but it has been 
that is race relations and racism and all those things, a wobbling bamboo bridge to keep focusing on race relations and their restrictive instruments of affirmative action, economic, black economic empowerment, and the black this and the black that, as various notions of transformation, is to put formalin around social transition and to render permanent the wobbling bamboo bridge. To retain and maintain racism's evocative power as primary to the psychology of transition is to deflect attention from other, perhaps even more fundamental tendencies in South African history. While racial thinking and its various variations have shaped much of South African history, they are not fundamental to its future. What is more fundamental was not created by racial thinking, but that racial think, but what racial thinking was mobilized for. It was mobilized for the growth of Western economies in the 19th and 20th centuries. It was for these economies that mines and factories were established in South Africa. It is the labor for these mines that necessitated the disposition of, the disposition of conquered peoples of their lands, the destruction of their economies, and their massive conscription as labor. What the, dispossesses, the dispossessed became when they congregated in the mines, factories, and farms of South Africa is a story that is yet to be told and holds the key to the future. When Mrs. Shangase and her family decided to move from their Deben suburb back to their township, they were part of a growing trend. Soweto, the ultimate symbol of the South African township, is starting to take back her children. Santin, with all its glitter, turned out not to be a home after all. More moving there may have been a part of affirming the constitutional rights of movement and claiming back the land. I will live anywhere I like in this country is an understandable reaction. But it turns out the suburbs were no home after all. And it makes sense. South African suburbs are a product of a long history of political racism. For the dispossessed let into them, they represent existential discomfort and deep political anxieties. If you were there out of compulsion, you may be there now to make a statement. That statement you learn could never be the sum total of your reason to be. Thank you. Your reason to be took more than a century to establish. Soweto, a sprawling city of approximately two million people, is unrecognizable from its origins in 1904 when British controlled city authorities removed black South Africans and Indian residents of brick fields to an evacuation camp at Clapsprake Municipal Sewage Farm outside the Johannesburg Municipal Boundary following a reported outbreak of plague. Now, it is fascinating that people feared to be possible carriers of plague were moved to a sewage farm where the plague was guaranteed to have five-star hotel conditions to proliferate. Two further townships were laid out to the east and the west of Johannesburg in 1918. Townships to the southwest of Johannesburg followed, starting with Pimville in 1934 and renamed, a renamed part of Cape Sprite in Orlando in 1935. And so what came to be Soweto 
grew into a multi-ethnic melting pot, a congregation of millions of the dispossessed throughout the subcontinent of Southern Africa. Once there, they lived and worked together, and over the decades, they became a different people altogether. They heard new languages and spoke them. They experienced new cultures and lived them. They intermarried. They became the first full-blown working class of Africa, a new people with a vastly expanded awareness far beyond that of their rural origins. They either lived in mine compounds or set up their own houses somewhere. Some among the nascent intelligentsia began to talk about the concept of the new African. They became the first people in Africa to undergo a vast industrial, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-intellectual adaptation of unprecedented scale. This is the miracle that came along the way of the dispossessed. They found one another there and built social solidarities they had never experienced before and which have grown. What the multi-ethnic founders of the African National Congress hoped for to unite the dispossessed came on its own over decades of urban consolidation. As the economy they built and the laws that supported it grew in their power over them, they began to resist its deleterious economic and political effects. Their efforts ultimately led to the democracy that was born on the 27th of April, 1994. Santin is in Gauteng, the richest province in South Africa and the heartbeat of its economy. Hundreds of thousands from all corners of South Africa and beyond traveled to Johannesburg, a city that fired their imaginations. They called it a goalie or Gauteng, the city of gold. But the gold reef spread east and west of Johannesburg such that Gauteng became a generalized area beyond its Johannesburg center. Today, it carries the name of an entire province. The naming of this province is a just recognition of a phenomenon that even the Constitution has missed. Section 1B of the founding provisions of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa refers to the two values of non-racialism and non-sexism. The extensive consultation process to put the Constitution together missed out two critical values built over a century of living them in the townships of South Africa, non-ethnicism and multiculturalism. The dominance of race relations in the public imagination today has blocked out the treasure of South African history, a cosmopolitanism that flourished in various ways in the townships. The real strategic alternative to whiteness is not blackness, but multi-ethnic identities in a common constitutional citizenship in which multi-ethnic bonding took place to various degrees in the townships of South Africa. Even if tragedies and triumphs occurred, it was bonding nevertheless. White South Africans, in the main, chose formally to stay out of that historic process. Mostly, they were blissfully unaware of it. Where did they sought, uh, where they sought to tear, to, where they saw it, that solidarity, they, they, they tried to tear it apart. They are now free to become a part of a greater human solidarity, the township's greatest gift to the people of South Africa and perhaps to the world. Santin in its triumph represents an economy that has been and continues to be in a predatory relationship with the overwhelming bulk of its population. 
if the primary purpose of an economy is to enhance the welfare of its citizens, then the wealth of South Africa should no longer be exported to the same degree for the continuous enrichment of other countries, regardless of the merits of globalization. If sent <laughs> If Sentin fundamentally continues to serve that role, if it structurally represents the ultimate purpose in Africa of asset global accumulation and the value accretion in the long, Beni, in the long journey from Berlin, it cannot be the symbol of success of the South African economy, but its failure. While Sentin cannot be irrelevant to the success of the South African economy, it cannot, in its current orientation, be its defining essence. Its opulent success contains within itself a moral repudiation it has not even begun to address. There are people in South Africa today who have begun to dream of a return to pre-colonial land dispensations. These are dreams too ghastly to contemplate. They will almost certainly tear South Africa apart. The Berlin Conference parceled out territories in Africa for better or for worse. The unitary image of South Africa as a land, ma as a land mass, internally rearranged since 1994, is fixed in the minds of, of the overwhelming majority of South Africa's population whatever their ownership relationship to it. So is its economic landscape and social landscape. We cannot afford to undo the legacy of multi-ethnic and multicultural congregation that continues and which now requires the express attention of a democratic state that has rediscovered a key and necessary foundation for its future. The families, to conclude, the families of Mrs. Shangase and Mr. Mahabane, who have returned to the opportunities they have discovered in their respective formative origins, and join us to take the journey with them, part real, part conceptual, from Santin to Soweto. They urge us to go along with them into the future then perhaps armed with success, we will pass by in that journey in Berlin, where Berliners will have surely agonized over the implications of Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century for Global Peace and Welfare. And we will say to them in Berlin, we in South Africa have found new ways to truly humanize capitalism and perhaps avoid the next global wars. We have reconceptualized and restructured South Africa's economy to make life livable for all its citizens. New political parties, we will say, have emerged to give political energy to imagined visions informed by a new awareness. We have reconceptualized asset ownership and the accretion of its value and we have, even in the process, confronted capitalism's illusion of the absolute autonomy of the individual, that millions and billions and trillions of rands, dollars, and euros owned by few individuals and few nations, including them, quantums of appropriated global and local social value, and that real estate purportedly owned by them, can never, in the scheme of human evolution, be theirs entirely. So perhaps with this festival, celebrating 20 years of democracy in South Africa, Berliners and Sowetans will begin a new journey of sharing the world, not seeking to own it. Soweto, in this context, may very well be the new mother city of South Africa. On that day in Berlin, 
we may even meet in the Chancellor's Palace with the huge 16-foot high maps of Germany and South Africa on their walls to share the stories of how we have successfully remade ourselves as a people. Thank you.